study the axilla. Axilla is also called the armpit. So this convex part on the lateral aspect of the thorax and the upper medial part of the arm, this is called the arm pinch or what is called, this, is, this area is called the axilla. So boundaries they are formed in the axilla part. So here lies the, in the upper part lies the clavicle, the upper part. And below here lies the head of the humerus, the shoulder joint, later is the greater tubercle, medial is the lesser tubercle, and the intertubercular groove is the lateral and the medial lip and the floor. And this is the glenoid cavity with supraglenoid and the infraglenoid tubercle, this is the lateral border of the scapula, the inferior angle of the scapula and the medial border and here lies the coronoid process. This is the sternum, the articulation, the body. And here lies the second rib, third, the fourth, and so on, along with the ribs, that is the first rib, second rib, third, the fourth, the fifth anteriorly. So this hollow below the shoulder joint is called the armpit or what is called the axilla. So the boundaries they are muscular. This is called the anterior boundary, posterior, the lateral and the medial. And it has got the apex and the base. So anterior boundary is formed by the anterior fold or anterior boundary is formed by the pectoralis major muscle which takes in from the medial half of the clavicle side of the sternum and below it is with the external oblique muscle of the abdomen interdigitate and from here it is inserted over the lateral rib of the Bicepital group. So that is the pectoralis major from the. So with the insertion, so this from the lower border of the pectoralis major muscle. And this is the upper border inserting into the lateral lip and forming the delto pectoral group. So this lower border of the pectoralis major from the anterior or the front boundary of the what is called the axilla, the anterior bone. And as the pectoralis minor is also parallel with the major, so if both the pectoral muscles they form the anterior boundary of the axilla. While this is the scapula and this is the subscapular fossa, and from the subscapular fossa there is a the muscle that is called the subscapularis, which is inserted over the lesser tubercle. Subscapular muscle is taking region from here, and from the lateral border of the scapula, in the upper part, teres minor muscle, and below is the teres major. The teres major is inserted on the medial lip of the bicepital group, and. From the back side comes the latissimus dorsi muscle. So this latissimus dorsi comes in the lower border of the, touching the lower border of the teres major and comes anteriorly.
and its tendon is reversed. The lower fibers they go up and upper fibers they go low and is inserted into the groove of the intertubercular groove. So that's my dorsi in the middle, in the groove of, of bicepital, medially, in the medial lip is the insertion of the teres major and from the later lip is the insertion of the pectoralis major. So pectoralis major from the anterior boundary, while the posterior boundary is formed by the latissimus dorsi along with the teres major. So they are the posteriorly placed boundaries, that is the latissimus dorsi and below is the latissimus dorsi and teres major muscle, they form the posterior boundary. So anterior boundary and the posterior boundary, they are parallel but they are away from each other. The medial boundary, if we see, if we push our hand higher up in the axilla, then the tips of my finger will touch the first rib, the second rib and the intercostal spaces and the fascia covering. So it forms the medial boundary of the axilla formed by the lateral surface of the upper ribs and from here a muscle is taking origin which is going backward that is the serratus anterior. So serratus anterior muscle taking origin from the upper ribs, upper eight ribs and it is going on the back side and it curves with the convexity of the ribs and it gains the insertion in the medial border of the scapula. So it forms the medial boundary. If we push our hand into the axilla on the lateral aspect, the lateral part is formed by the surgical neck of the humerus. And with the surgical neck, the bicepital groove. So bicepital groove forms the lateral boundary of the axilla. And the apex lies over the first rib and this is lower part is the base of the axilla which is formed by the convex deep fascia which is called the axillary fascia because here the outside is the skin then this yellow color is the superficial fascia fat and below is the deep fascia of the arm this same deep fascia from the axillary fascia and then this fascia is continuous in the later part of the thoracic wall of the thoracic. So this is how the axillary fascia exists which we have already done but how it is attached to the clavi pectoral fascia and maintains the convexity of the armpit or what is called the axilla. So this is how we do the axillary boundaries. Now after the boundaries come the contents. So contents we have already done. So whatever it lies in the concavity of the clavicle, below the clavicle, that is the, what are the contents? So contents they are the medial most content in the axillary vein. Then the axillary artery and laterally the lateral cord of the brachial plexus along with their branches. The posterior cord is lying posterior to the artery. The medial cord lies in between the axillary vein and axillary. So here we do the contents as the axillary artery. Axillary artery, as we know, it has got three parts. The axillary artery starts from the lateral border of the first rib. Before this lateral border, the name was subclavian artery. From the outer border of the first rib, its name changes now, it is called the axillary artery. This is the first part of the axillary artery. The first part of the axillary artery starts from the lateral border of the first rib and it ends at the upper border of the pectoralis minor. So this is the first part of the axillary artery. The second part of the axillary artery, it starts from the upper border of the pectoralis minor and this artery goes behind the pectoralis minor. When it goes behind, so it is the second part of the axillary artery. Then this axillary artery then comes downward 
इनटू द एग दिला एंड नाउ इट इज ऑल द थर्ड पार्ट ऑफ द एग्जिलरी आर्टरी स्टार्ट फ्रॉम द लिटरल बॉर्डर ऑफ द पेक्टोरियस माइनर एंड इट एंड्स एट द लोअर बॉर्डर ऑफ द टीरियस मेजर सो दिस इज द थर्ड पार्ट ऑफ द एग्जिलरी आर्टरी सो दिस इज हाउ वी डिवाइड द आर्टरी टू द फर्स्ट पार्ट सेकंड पार्ट and the third part now branches of these arteries they are very important axillary artery the first part has got one branch second part has got two branch and third part has got the three branch the first part of the axillary artery gives the branch that is called the superior thoracic artery as its name suggests superior thoracic artery supply the superior part of the thorax for the chest wall then the second part of the axillary artery as we have done it has got two branches one branch we have already done that is the thoraco acromial artery so this was the thoraco acromial artery which was pierced in the thoraco clavicular fascia and comes up and divided into four branches clavicular deltoid clavic acromial and the pectoral branch then near the lower border of the pectoris minor second part of the axillary artery gives the second branch and name of the second branch because it runs on the lateral aspect of the thoracic wall is called the lateral thoracic artery and it supplies the lateral part of the thorax so that's why its name is lateral thoracic artery then the third part of the axillary artery starts from the lateral border of the pectoris minor up to the lower border of the teres major so this is the third part and third part has got three branches name of these branches you have to remember one is called the lateral scapular artery and the name suggest lateral scapular artery runs over the lateral border of the scapula so this is the lateral border of the scapula so this artery runs over the lateral part of the scapula and supply the subscapularis muscle so a large branch goes to the subscapularis muscle to supply between the origin of the teres minor and teres major so this branch is called the subscapular branch so it is subscapular artery it runs on the lateral border of the lateral border of the scapula that's why its name is lateral or subscapular artery then it gives two more branches at the surgical neck one is called the posterior circumflex humeral artery which runs behind the posterior surface of the shaft of the humerus under the cover of the deltoid muscle and it encircles around the humerus and it supplies the deltoid muscle posteriorly there is a circumflexing like this and another branch is the anterior circumflex humeral so it goes from the anterior aspect and it goes and touches the surgical neck of the humerus and below the deltoid muscle it enters most with the posterior circumflex humeral artery the anterior posterior circumflex humeral they go around the surgical neck of the humerus that's why they are called circumferential branch so this is how we do the branch of the axillary so wherever the arteries are going we know veins are coming from that region so all the veins coming from the anterior circumflex humeral posterior circumflex humeral then the subscapular vein then the lateral thoracic vein all these veins they all are opening into the axillary vein which is nearby here and axillary vein lies medial most and this axillary vein goes upward and then it is continuous with the as the subclavian vein from the outer border of the first ring it is called subclavian so axillary vein is formed by the collection of the veins accompanying the branches of the axillary artery So in this way, the formation of the axillary vein is in the medial most in position. Then the cause of the brachial plexus. 
we know the third part of the, and second part of the MDRT, the relations of the courts we have already done that later to the second and third part of the MDRT lies the later court. Medial to the first, second and third part lies the medial court. And posterior to the second and third part of exilary RT lies the posterior court. So this is the contents of the axilla. Then come the axillary lymph nodes. So axillary lymph nodes, they are also having the four groups depending upon the borders of the boundaries of the axilla. So one which is present along the anterior border or lower border of the teres pectoris major and here lies the veins. So this is the called anterior group. So anterior group is also called the pectoral group because it lies along the pectoralis major muscle plus along the lateral border of the pectoralis minor along with the lateral thoracic artery and vein. So this is the anterior group along parallel to the anterior border of the or boundary of the axilla. Then the posterior border. Posterior border is along the lateral border of the scapula, where lies the subscapular artery. So it is also called the subscapular group. So subscapular vein and artery near to them, the lymph nodes are present, so they are called the subscapular group or the posterior group of the axillary lymph then the lateral group. Lateral group lies in touch with the lateral boundary that is formed by the surgical neck. So these are the lateral group of the lymph nodes. So they receive the lymphatics from the arm. The anterior and the posterior group, they receive the from the breast and from the thoracic wall and from the back. So this is how we do the anterior group, posterior group, later group. Then there is also the group is the medial group. So medial group lies along the lateral thoracic wall. And all lymph nodes ultimately comes here also. So here lymph nodes lie in the superficial fascia. In the fat, they are embedded in the fat of the superficial fascia of the axilla. This is the axillary fascia, and this is the superficial fascia that is the yellow color fat. So, embedded in the yellow color fat of the superficial fascia of the axilla, here lies the embedded in it the central group of the lymph nodes. Because it lies in the center of the axilla, not in the anterior group, not in the posterior group, not in the lateral or the middle group. So it lies in the center, so they are called the central group of the and lymphatics, they are all connected here from all the groups. Then whole of the lymph from here ultimately goes up. The lymphatics they run along the subclavian axillary vein. The lymph nodes they are present along the subclavian vein. And these lymph nodes, as we have done, below the clavicular fascia. So these lymph nodes they encircle the axillary vein. So these lymph nodes they are called the apical group. So they are the apical group because they lie near the apex of the axilla. So all the lymphatics from all the groups ultimately go into the apical group of the lymph. And from this apical group of the lymph nodes, then the lymphatics ultimately they go into the supraclavicular lymph nodes. And supraclavicular lymph nodes, as we know, they are the 
lymph nodes or the lymphatics from the cervical part of the lymphatics. So on the right and left side, there is a deep cervical lymph nodes, jugular diagastric and jugular homohyoid. So a duct starts from them and this duct is called the right cervical lymphatic duct and this duct will open into the subclavian vein at the junction of internal jugular and the subclavian vein. On the left side, the thoracic duct is there. So this thoracic duct on the left side will open into the junction. Where lies a single lymph node that is called the virtual lymph node. So this is how the lymphatics of the breast and the upper limb ultimately goes to the cervical lymphatic channel or the lymphatic duct. So this is the axilla and its contents. Regarding its applied anatomy of this axilla, one is called the crunch paralysis. Crunch paralysis. So crunch is a support of the handicapped people who has to support their arm for their walking. So this crunch when touches the lower part of the ankle arm, which so because of the injury, so this crunch will cause the injury to the medial cord of the vehicle plexus. And injury to the medial cord of the vehicle plexus or in other way, the injury to the ulnar nerve, it leads to the paralysis of the muscles supplied by the ulnar nerve, that is the claw hand deformity and the C8 and T1 nerve they are involved. Due to the injury of the C8 and T1 nerve, ulnar nerve is the mainly involved along with the medial half of the median nerve is also having the C8 and T1 contribution. So, whichever cranial with the nerves of the upper limb having the C8 and T1 contribution will be affected and this lead to the crutch paralysis. Another applied of the Axilla is the intercostobrachial neuralgia. So intercostobrachial nerve is actually is the nerve of the second intercostal space T2 nerve. So T2 nerve has got a lateral branch and this branch passes through the central group of the lymph nodes and this supplies a part of the skin on the medial upper part of the skin of the arm. So this nerve is called the intercostobrachial nerve because actually it is a C2 nerve that is the, it lies in the second intercostal space, the intercostal nerve. But its lateral cutaneous branch, it passes in the axilla and it passes in the superficial fascia of the fat because it is a sensory nerve or the cutaneous nerve. And it passes to the when it passes through the superficial fascia of the axilla, it pierces the lymph nodes, the central group of the lymph nodes, and then it reaches its destination to supply the skin of the upper medial part of the arm. So, due to the infection, either on the upper limb infection, the lymph nodes, the pus travels through the lymphatics and they reach the skin. And the central group, it leads to the, so the central group, they are get enlarged because of the infection. And this enlargement of the lymph node is called the lymphadenopathy. And these enlarged lymph nodes will press the intercostobrachial nerve. And the pressure effect of the compressive neuropathy of this intercostobrachial nerve will lead to the severe pain in the axilla. In any movement of the axilla, it gives the pain. So this pain is because of the intercostobrachial neuralgia is the condition is called. Another condition is the, we know in the axilla they are like the axillary hair. So these axillary hairs they are also prone to the injury and whenever they are pulled, 
and subsequently root of the hair get infection and root of the hair when get the infection the pus is formed and this pus then through the lymphatics goes to the central loop of the lymph nodes and all the central loop of lymph nodes they are involved and this lead to the pain in the arm pit or the axilla and this condition called folliculitis so folliculitis is nothing but this is the infection of the axillary root of the hairs so if it is superficially situated then it makes a opening and a sinus is formed here and through which the pus is discharged but if it is deeply seated then it may involve the central loop of the lymph nodes and their enlargement and this condition may be prolonged and becomes more painful and it may involve the intercostal brachial nerve also so intercostal brachial neuralgia can also occur due to the folliculitis also or any infection travel from the any injury to the fingers infection of forearm or arm lymphatic drainage has to pass through the central loop of the lymph nodes so this is how we do the this axilla along with their axillary and axilla the applied anatomy related to that that's it.